Coming up on Living in Omaha, Mayor P.J. Morgan is now President Morgan. We'll see how the city is adjusting and take a look at possible contenders for Omaha's next mayor. Stay with us. Living in Omaha is funded in part by Eidelman Telemarketing and its over 5,000 team members and by over 33,000 people like you who are members of Nebraskans for Public Television. Welcome to another edition of Living in Omaha. I'm Marlene Ong. This week begins a juggling act for P.J. Morgan as he becomes Omaha's part-time mayor and now full-time president of Duncan Aviation in Lincoln. When Morgan is in Lincoln as a corporate president, City Council President Sabian Zaldo will become acting mayor. We're going to look at some of our past mayors and the roles and responsibilities of that office. Former Omaha Mayor Eugene Leahy joins us along with Jim Johnson. He is Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska at Omaha campus. Welcome. Gene, first off, can you tell me how the Office of Mayor has changed since you were in office? Well, uh, um, the government has become bigger, there's no question about mm -hmm. that. And uh, because there have been so many unfortunate federal mandates and state mandates that have come down that uh, forces local government to come up with uh, solutions to some problems that have allegedly been remedied by state and federal legislation. And that requires a, a tremendous financial burden. Uh, you have to hire additional policemen, you have to hire, uh, hire additional staff for the office. So in that respect, it's become a lot larger than it was when I was mayor uh, some 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. Jim, um we have changed to a strong mayor council form of government mm -hmm. back in 1956, 1957 became effective then. Is that a good, um, is that the best way to handle such a large um, city such as Omaha? I guess that uh, generally I, I would think that a strong mayor council system is best for a, a reasonably large city. Uh, almost all of the largest cities have that system, uh, somewhat smaller cities tend to have what's called the um, uh, council manager form, where instead of an elected mayor, they have a, uh, a professional uh, public administrator who does the executive. But I think that for us, this is probably the best way. Gene, mm -hmm. you um, have seen the, the form of commission, form of government prior to your election to office. Uh, was that a good way for Omaha to, to have um, conducted it their uh, government? Well, it was an interesting form of government. However, that was long before I really got to Omaha and involved in the political arena. After all, I didn't get out of law school until 1960 and not involved in the political system until 62, you might say, from that day on. But uh, I used to meet with uh, some of the people who were commissioned people back then. Uh, fantastic, uh, fabulous stories they would tell about the control that they had in their respective mm -hmm. little empires. Right. Uh, one would have the streets and the other would have the parks. and and they would tell about how, well, it was like uh, uh, their little individual controlled uh, government. That's right. And uh, they called the shots who would be employed and so on. I believe that's correct, is it not, Jim? But mm -hmm. uh, today we don't need that form of government. Uh, we need to be more responsible and responsive to the needs of all the people, not just the people in a given uh, geographical area of a major right. city. Yeah, one, I think Portland is the only major city that still uses that system. Uh, the commission form? The commission form. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to balance that kind of a system with district style of election, for example, and uh, so you have a different style of representation and uh, a, a very different style of executive because you don't have a single person, you have all these different uh, little chiefdoms. That's mm -hmm. right, that's a good way of putting it. Gene, we have seen different mayors come and go, of course every four years we have a, a new election. Has the office of mayor changed over those, um, for each of those uh, incumbent? Well, uh, has it changed? 
when they're when they're in office well you got different personalities that's right. with certainty uh, and that's about the only difference that I see because the government itself the charter doesn't change except once every 10 years if something comes along and you have a charter review committee by law you have to and we just had one here recently mm -hmm. but the recommended changes to the charter but other than that the government stays pretty stable and that's what I like about it I think that's the point that Jim was trying to make that today it is a good thing and a good form of government but so, I really don't ch the personalities change so even if we do have a different type of personality as a mayor, the city government still runs effectively and efficiently as just because of the type of government we have, Jim? Well, I think largely also uh, a lot of it is tradition, although I, I would say yeah, if you get the, the wrong personality and there's someone who's very abrasive, who can't work with the city council or who doesn't have contact with uh, the economic community or something like that, you could have a... a of an unfortunate kind of situation. So the personality of uh, a strong executive is always an important thing because that personality has a lot to do with how they delegate authority, how, they, how thin skinned they are and how well they can take the heat of the kitchen and things of that sort. And um, uh, I think you can see that indeed in some of the mayors that we've had that uh, their personalities <laughs> did not uh, make it them quite as effective, <coughs> perhaps. Mm -hmm. Jim has made that point very well, in that one must necessarily be able to get along, uh, not only in the business community, but in the, the uh, social oh, community. Uh, right. You have to look at the total community, all the people involved as your leaders. See, we, we, we make a mistake in our society today thinking that elected political figures are the only leadership. You know, we have leaders okay. in the professions that should be brought forward, brought out, uh, encouraged to become involved. We got labor, we got business. <coughs> so there's a lot more to it. The clergy, for example, ought sure. to be uh, one of them that really brought out, particularly today when we hear about uh, violence and, and juvenile crime and uh, the breakup of the family unity, right. unit. And uh, he spoke, uh, Jim spoke very well when he said that uh, we need someone in the mayor's office who has that ability to get along with all of these people and bring them into a common forum. Was P.J. Morgan effective in that regards? I would say generally so, yeah. Um, I, I think that probably uh, every mayor might have some problem with some particular part of the, on the because Omaha is a big community and there are a lot of different interests and it's, it's hard to be uh, seen as a friend of all of them because some of them want you to do one thing and others want you to do something else, <laughs> but I think generally. But you know it's an interesting observation about uh, politicians who run for the office of mayor, for example, saying, well, I'm going to run it like a business. You cannot run government like a business because we don't make a, a coffee cup. We know how much it costs to make right. it, how much it costs to market it, and how much you must have back for that product to be able to continue in business and expand and do research and so on. We run, government renders a service, mm -hmm. and we're talking about a service to how many different kinds of people, how many different levels of people, how many cultures, right. and uh, uh, we don't, uh, so you have to be prepared to serve the people and make certain that the service is provided and that's going to dictate mandate uh, an increase in revenues coming in in order to provide those services mm -hmm. because we can't say we're going to increase the cost of our product because we're going to need more money we don't right. make a product well you know jim um, a lot of people say that they need a good mayor in there who has a good strong business background like mayor morgan's mm -hmm. so is that i mean is, is that true then it, you shouldn't just have a mayor that's uh, business only uh, yeah, I think that Gene's right, that, that you have to have uh, a certain amount of ability to get along with all kinds of different sorts of people. I think that traditionally in Omaha, the, uh, and I think particularly, particularly with Mayor Morgan, um, the office of mayor has had a certain focus on economic development, certainly in the, the more recent years, um, which is not written into the job description, but is something that's kind of behind the scenes and, and still uh, is an important part of it. There's, in fact, I would suspect that a whole, a whole lot of what the mayor does isn't in the job description, it's just things that you're expected to do. Mm -hmm. But you know, the answer, uh, further answer to that, in my opinion, would be this, and I think I talked to you about that earlier last week, uh, Marlene, that the mayor has a responsibility of putting people in the cabinet that are going to do mm -hmm. the job that is necessary to satisfy the needs, the demands, the wants of the people. Mm -hmm. And no one person has that ability to do all those things. So that's where a mayor mm -hmm. was going to make the first mistake, is to think that he or she can be all-powerful and all things to all people. That's right. wrong. Now, if, you, if we surround ourselves as elected officials with the responsible people, 
will meet the demands, the needs, the wants of the people. Do you think it's fair to the public who voted for Mayor Morgan that he had that he left office? Can you tell me, Jim? Is it fair to the public? Um, or I any guess my own, my own my own feeling is that when someone runs for public office, they've uh, taken on a certain public trust, and that uh, it's something that one. Uh, gives up only under very, very serious situations. Um, I'm, I'm not sure for myself that, that this situation would be one that I would consider. Uh, I, I feel um, sympathy for notions of being wanting to spend more time with family and things of that sort, and if that uh, is, the, is the true motivation. Um, but I also think that those kinds of issues are always there, and politicians need to have those in mind <laughs> what do you think, Gene, as a former uh, mayor? Well, it's unfortunate that the decision was made as it was made and handed down to the people and given to the people. It's really too bad that uh, Mayor Morgan did not tell the people or learn about it earlier before he sought the re-election to the second term. I don't know what the reason or reasons are or were or whatever you want to say. Uh, but indeed, the, the mayor's right when he says that let's have the special election to allow the people to vote for that person who is to be the mayor, not a member of the city council who is going to be an acting mayor for the remainder of the term. No, no, we have a right to be served by one elected as mayor mm -hmm. and not as someone from the city council to serve as mayor. Well, in the World Herald, there was an editorial that suggested that politicians post a bond in addition to their filing fee in <laughs> case they happen to leave office mm -hmm. early like um, <coughs> P.J. Morgan mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Joe Friend, for instance. Mm -hmm. A bond to do what? To compensate the public. Oh, I see. If they to were offset to, the cost? To offset yeah. the cost. How often does yeah. this happen? Yeah. If it, if it were a common thing, then I guess that something like that might be <laughs> worthwhile. But, um, you know, life is life. And um, <coughs> it's, it, there, there are already, uh, why would anybody want to be in politics in the first place? I mean, the, the, the money isn't great. Uh, the uh, certainly being mayor is not some um, amazing power uh, package that you have. Uh, and it's hard enough to get people to get involved in uh, political service that uh, if you put additional um, financial obligations yes, right. involved with it, uh, then that means that only those people who with have money. very strong financial backing are going to have any, any chance. And already uh, it takes a reasonable financial backing as it is. Jim's mm -hmm. absolutely correct. You're going to deny this to someone who lacks the money. And uh, this is not the way we're supposed to be uh, operating and developing our governmental strategies and, uh, and services. No, no. My, but, okay. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. My own feeling is that uh, this experience probably will caution politicians in the future to think about these sorts of things uh, before elections rather than uh, having it come up after. Obviously, if, you know, someone gets mm -hmm. ill and needs to resign, that's going to happen and there's no way you can stop it. We may not see this happen again for many, many 50, yeah. 100 years. We don't know. Yeah. On that note, we have to end. Thank you very much, Eugene Leahy and also Jim Johnson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marlene. In Fun just a moment, here. I'll talk with two political analysts about the possible contenders for mayor. In April, P.J. Morgan surprised the city with his resignation as mayor of Omaha. Now comes the question of who will replace him. That question has been tossed around as the city council voted to amend the city charter for a special mayoral election. Now it's up to the citizens of Omaha to approve the amendments, allowing for the election on November 8th. My guests will speculate on who may run for mayor. Joining me are Richard Chagru, a local political analyst and professor of law at Creighton University and Jim Clary, who is a political consultant and a former city council member. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Jim, um, the city council just approved the amendments, as I, met, as I mentioned earlier, allowing for the special election in November. But the voters have to, of course, go to the polls July 19th to approve it. Do you think it'll pass? Oh, I don't think there's any question about it. You know, the, only the most dedicated voters are going to go out and vote on July 19th anyway, and it, it just seems inconceivable to me that those people who who cherish voting so much would vote uh, to turn it down. I, I don't think there's any question but that it'll pass. Mm -hmm. um, Dick, can we have avoided all this special election early on? Well, sure, we could have avoided it by 
changing the charter, uh, providing for a cure to that uh, legislative lacuna, if you will. Uh, the city council had an opportunity to put this on the ballot, I think at least three times and maybe more, uh, but it didn't, and now we have to go through that. I'd like to take exception to Jim's optimism on this. I, I think one of the things we have to watch out for is this. People are very unhappy with the notion of an expense of special elections. I think there may be a lot of folks who are just as dedicated to good, solid city government, but unhappy with the cost of government, who would come out and say, we're not going to do it just to spite you. And this could be even worsened by the failure of the city to solve the problem of yard waste collection. It's strange how those kinds of issues magnify themselves and in fact have a carryover on issues of such fundamental importance as how we choose our leaders. Mm -hmm. Well, Dick, I, I, uh, I see your point about the garbage and I think that's a good point. I think to me that all the more says people are going to want to have a say in who uh, solves those problems and who is their mayor, but we'll, we'll see. It'll be interesting. So do you mm -hmm. think it's best that the voters vote for the for the mayor of their choice rather than have city council appoint a mayor early in this term? Well, I certainly think that's preferable, and I pushed for that in, in 88 when I was on the council, uh, and I'm not happy about the cost either because, as Dick uh, said correctly, it should have been fixed before, and it hasn't been, but I still say Given the situation today, um, we ought to elect a mayor. I certainly will vote in favor of the charter amendment. Yeah. I'd be in favor. I would be in favor of the charter amendment. I'm not in favor of the expense of special elections, and we may have two uh, that are implicated in this whole process. And uh, the fact of the matter is, in the United States, we've gone through rather extensive periods of time with some of our very best leaders, who in effect were unelected. One of the greatest presidents of the 20th century, Harry S. Truman, for example, uh, came into office just a couple of months after uh, the final election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and served in one of the greatest presidencies in our history. So it's certainly conceivable that we could have a succession to office without the uh, multi-hundreds of thousands of dollars of expenditures that we have in this process in Omaha now. Well, we had something similar happen um, in the sense of the recall of Mike Boyle. We had four mayors that served in that, that same term. Jim, was that a, a very hectic time during Omaha political uh, scene? Well, certainly you would say that it was hectic in that we had that many people in the office of mayor, although some of them were only for a few months in situations of what we called an interim mayor. Uh, Steve Tomasek served in that role for a short period of time. Fred Conley served in that role for a short period of time. Um, and basically city government went on. Uh, th there's a lot of good people down in City Hall that I believe kept things going and, and things still got done. Um, but certainly it creates turmoil, no question. Mm -hmm. We do have a strong um, mayor council system of government. In that sense, you almost, you're almost saying that the city can run itself even without the presence of a, an elected mayor. Is that true, Dick? Well, I think, it's, I think it is true that the people who staff those offices, the civil servants who are appointed uh, with tenure, so to speak, do a st superb job for the taxpayers of Omaha. What a, a mayor can give and what a political campaign can help the mayor to give is a tone, a message, a theme of a mayorship, whether it's economic development, whether it's holding the line in taxes, or whether it's an issue such as the one that I think uh, beleaguers most Americans in urban society today, that's crime. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, the people of Omaha would like to have a mayor that has a strong business background like Mayor Morgan had, or has, or should it be an all-encompassing type of mayor that with various strengths? What well, do you, you think, Jim? You never know what the, uh, what the voters are going to want at any particular given election year, but I do think the fact that we've had a, a, a mayor like P.J. Morgan, who came from a strong business background, that that might tend to set the tone for what people at least initially look for in, in a candidate, uh, somebody who has his energy. He had a tremendous amount of energy uh, and, and provided that for the office, um, uh, spent a lot of energy um, uh, on economic development. 
And, and PJ, in a lot of ways, was sort of a deal maker. That was sort of the business uh, uh, background that he came out of, and he, and he uh, played that to good use in the mayor's office. For example, uh, the negotiations that he had with the College World Series people a couple of times that were quite successful. And I think people might at least initially look for somebody to kind of fit that mold, sure. I, you know, I think that uh, we, we sometimes equate the notion of strong business background and good political leadership, and the two aren't necessarily uh, the same. Uh, it's certainly possible to have an individual who's been a dedicated public servant, a person who's been successful as an attorney or a prosecutor or a judge, such as Gene Leahy, uh, come to a city government and do a remarkably uh, energetic job on behalf of the people. But by and large, I think Jim is right that many people would think that uh, this is a good bet. So now that we're looking for a new mayor, who do you think the people of <laughs> Omaha are looking for, Jim? Well, I think that you're going to see, uh, as we talked before the show began, a lot of people initially talk about throwing their hat in. It's my understanding a lot of those people have since already uh, uh, ruled it out. Um, and interestingly, Dick just mentioned uh, somebody that's uh, um, in or has uh, a record of government service, and one of the strong candidates that I hear speculated about has both government service uh, and some business experience, and that's former Congressman Hal Dobb. I think uh, the word is that he most likely will throw his hat in the ring. Uh, he's certainly talking about it a lot. Um, certainly, Subi Anzaldo is going to run, and uh, Dick Takechi, of course, has al already announced. So you're going to have at least those three. Uh, well-known people in the race, and I'm sure there'll be others. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenda Council, for example, a former president of the Board of Education and an incumbent uh, member of the City Council has been named. Anne Boyle, the wife of the former uh, mayor of this town and a person whose lifelong uh, work has been in uh, government and politics. Uh, a host of people of that nature. The thing we have to remember is that uh, this arrangement really calls for a primary and a general election. If the individual uh, in the first race can't get more than 50 percent of the vote, and in, a, in an election with as many as eight or ten candidates as there might very well be, it's conceivable that the two top vote getters may be men or women with as few as 15 percent of the vote uh, each. Uh, that will make for very interesting politics. It'll also make for very interesting politics to have uh, uh, Hal Dobb, a, f a former member of Congress, uh, uh, who uh, some people say uh, does not meet the constitutional or charter requirements because they say he's a resident of McLean, Virginia and not a resident of Omaha, Nebraska, uh, which he became a resident of McLean, at least for charter purposes, upon his defeat in the Congress of the United States. That's a position that I think at least will be fun to watch evolve uh, if Mr. Dobb gets into the race. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's my understanding that, although I'm sure that will be an issue, Dick, that Hal uh, does meet the residency requirements and is prepared to, you know, answer any questions about that. I, uh, your comment about uh, the number of people that get in, I would really be surprised if when it finally comes down to it, you'll see that many, at least that many serious candidates in, because like all races like this, it costs money to run and, and the fundraising is going to be highly competitive. Uh, this will be very unusual that we have a mayor's uh, election or any city election in an even numbered year when all the other races are out there. Now that's, that's really going to make it a tough go, I think, for somebody to raise enough money to be competitive in a race like this. But there have been a lot of people who have been mentioned, um, even though you're saying that they may not f actually take out uh, a petition, but there's been people like Mike Fahey, Tim Hall, State Senator, Steve McAllister, John Green, um, Herman Cain, for instance, and that was something new to me. Uh, Mike Boyle, even though Ann Boyle may well, be Mr. Boyle had indicated on his radio show this past week that he was not going to be a candidate for the office, but three of those others whom you have named at least are being talked about uh, by some Democratic leaders in the community, Fahey, uh, Tim Hall, John Green. If you add those to the incumbent members of the city council and then just pick one or two others such as Mr. Dobb, uh, you've got a field starting out of eight men and, and, and women in this race. Well, uh, Jim, who would you like to see run for mayor if you had a list of candidates? Well, I think most of the people we've mentioned so far are certainly uh, good people. 
They're certainly qualified, and we mentioned a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats. Um, I don't. I'm not going to pick one person right now and say this is is my person. Um, uh, there's just an awful lot of good people. I, I I think that that people who care about good government and care about Omaha uh, is the kind of person that you need. It, it, even though a lot of the people involved have been in, in involved in partisan politics, uh, I really do believe that the office itself. Um, and, and that the voters look at it with a little bit of a non-partisan uh, flair because the, the problems, garbage for example, uh, you know, th there really isn't a Republican or Democrat way to solve the garbage problem. Uh, oh sure, you could, you could say that a Republican might look a little bit more toward uh, um, uh, you know, privatization and be more worried about the, the cost factor or something like that, but in fact we have uh, privatized uh, contractors right now doing the garbage and, and it's presenting big yeah, problems. Yeah, they're doing a great job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I do think the voters tend to look at that office differently. Uh, the, you know, we have intelligent voters. They can they can make a distinction between, um, you know, what what the qualifications of the office are and the type of person that needs to be in there. Jim is clearly correct on that because I believe one of the great successes of P.J. Morgan has been his ability to reach out to people of both political persuasions and, and independence as well. Bring them into discussions, bring them into his administration, and uh, uh, go across the board of the political spectrum uh, to try to lead this community. Well, you're saying that PJ is a, was a, an effective mayor. In your eyes, who do you think would be an effective mayor to take his place? Well, I agree with Jim that any of these persons whom we have named bring something to the table whether it's experience in government and politics, whether it's experience in business, uh, uh, the practice of law like the practice of political consultancy and public relations is after all, as Jim can very well tell you, the running of a small business. So each of these persons whom we ha have named uh, uh, would give us a good race. It would be fun to watch them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you named some candidates, but can I pin both of you down for the one person you would like to see as mayor of Omaha? Jim Clary. <laughs> no, Dick, you're not going to say no. that. Uh, well, I think of the ones mentioned, certainly, um, I think the two strongest candidates would be Hal Dobb and Sobe Anzaldo. Uh, Hal, because he served this district and this city basically uh, for eight years, he was, it, some of his strengths were constituent service. He was almost known for that. And, and that's a lot of what being mayor is all about, is being in close touch with, with constituent problems. Uh, Subby certainly, you have to uh, uh, say, is a contender in my opinion because he's president of the city council. He's been um, uh, very active in getting around, and I think he's grown in the job uh, since he became president. Um, I think he's done a good job as president of the council. I just think you have to see him as a contender. I think mm -hmm. when it finally comes down to it, as I see the landscape today, here in June, those are the two contenders. Dick, we only have time for you to mention a name. Can you Brenda just Council. All right. Thank you very much, Richard Chagru and Jim Clary. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Marlene. That's it for this edition of Living in Omaha. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. If you would like to share your comments or suggestions, contact Living in Omaha. Our address is KYNE TV, 60th and Dodge Streets, Omaha, Nebraska, 68182, or call area code 402-554-2516. Living in Omaha is funded in part by Eidelman Telemarketing and its over 5,000 team members and by over 33,000 people like you who are members of Nebraskans for public television.